and the music stopped. Good morning, friends. Good to see you. Somebody answered. Thank you, Chris. Good to see you today. Uh, glad that you are here. I think you're glad that you are here. Trust that this morning is a blessing to God and to us as we are here to worship, to praise, to honor him throughout this gathering time and seek to, uh, to do that. And by his grace, he will be pleased and we will be edified and built up in the faith and, and, uh, and fellowship as well. Several announcements this morning. Uh, after this morning's service, there is a Vacation Bible School volunteers meeting at the school cafeteria. Lunch will be provided. So VBS meeting, head over soon after the service uh, for lunch and a, and a meeting over there. Next Sunday, I would like to uh, do a little walkthrough of our uh, Little Lambs Preschool and Nursery Wing. That space gets used along with the playground by different people at different times of the week. So I'd like to encourage you to please, as parents of children that use the playground or in the nursery or Little Lambs Preschool over there, and teachers and workers, that uh, we be able to just gather in a little group. We're going to do a walkthrough and a talk through so that everybody understand what goes where and how to best steward that space. So um, pleasant conversation and just informative conversation is all I'm asking for. That, uh, that there will be a better understanding going forward because it is a multi-use place that works really well and there's a lot of benefit there. So let's figure out how to team up on that. Also, I've been asked to share uh, an announcement regarding mowing. I, I'm not sure whether to exactly how to present this, but it sounds like Mike is going to meet the mower, the team that is signed up for mowing up here and he's going to give you property deeds to certain, is that, is that what I heard? <laughs> to certain sections of the property here. Uh, I guess that's not quite it. I'm, Pastor says we give away islands but not grass. Um, Mike's going to hand out the, uh, the slips so uh, you, you'll, you'll know what your assignment is. By the way, how many have noticed the grass is starting to grow around here now? Yeah, greening up, growing, wonderful. Yes. VBS's first priority mowing is. Go to VBS. Mike will get his his assignment to you one way or another. I want to share a missions a missionary family uh, heart of a letter. Do we have do we have photos up for the slides up for the Templetons? No. We'll work on that. should be up there, but we'll see about that. Let me share with you some things that have been put together or brought out of a missionary prayer letter. This month, we will be highlighting the Templetons, John, Lorena, Nora, Alina, and Lucas serving in Panferda, Spain. Yep. Okay, I'll learn more. Since we have coaches here in Spanish, I'll, I'll, I'll improve. In January, we met as a church family for the first time in a new building with no sofas, nor dining room, nor haphazard seating. Please understand, I sought translation on haphazard. <laughs> Random is a word we would use, meaning they have uniform seating now instead of the aforementioned things. So progress. We had a microphone, chairs, and a pulpit. For nine years, we have met in living rooms. The building does not belong to us, but it is a blessing given how our family has grown, and by God's grace, we will continue to grow a church planning work here by the Templetons. On February 25th, we celebrated two years as a church body. May God continue to add to our number and increase our love of our Savior. We want to express our gratitude to you for your partnership in the advance of the gospel in our valley God is using you and answering your prayers. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the Templetons and the work that you're doing 
in their family and in the church planting work that you're doing through them. Thank you for this note of progress. Thank you for this two-year celebration. Thank you for a new church plant and the people that have been saved and are growing, disciples that have been made and are growing, and others along the way. Thank you that we can gather here today and sing to you and rejoice in various aspects of you, your promises to us, your word, your grace to us. Help us to joy in you and rejoice in you much. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As we begin our service this morning, our song service, we're going to sing a song entitled, How Good It Is. Let me just read you the first line, because this really describes the song. Oh, how good it is when the family of God dwells together in spirit, in faith and unity, where the bonds of peace, of acceptance and love, are the fruits of his presence here among us. Let's sing together this morning, How Good It Is. <clears throat> Good. Let's sing together in Christ alone. <clears throat>
be seated. How our Christ is also described in 1 Corinthians 13. We'll review verses 1 to 3 again this morning together. Together, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am become sounding brass or clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. First Corinthians 13, 1 to 3. Men forward, and they're going to prepare for. This Lord's Supper, before we do that, I want to express my appreciation for how you just sang. I'm from Chicago. We don't, we Chicagoans don't get goosebumps very often, uh, but I got goosebumps listening to you sing. And Steve, thank you for leading the verses differently depending on what those words say. He's in the grave, but then he comes forth bursting in victory over death. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Now I want to draw your attention to another song. If you'll turn in your bulletins to page 12. We're going to sing this later on this morning. But the song is His Robes for Mine. And I thought I'd take you through those words before we participate in the Lord's Supper. If you look at the first verse, his robes for mine, O wonderful exchange, clothed in my sin, Christ suffered neath God's rage. Draped in his righteousness, I'm justified. In Christ I live, for in my place he died. What a wonderful thing it is to know that we were born in sin, that Adam's sin was imputed to mankind, to us. But Jesus' righteousness was imputed to those who believe. And we stand before God justified because his righteousness is on our account. Second verse says, his robes for mine. What cause have I for dread? God's daunting law. Christ mastered in my stead. Faultless I stand with righteous works not mine, saved by my Lord's vicarious death and life. And you'll notice verse 3 deals with propitiation. Verse 1, justification. But verse 3, his robes for mine. God's justice is appeased. Jesus is crushed. And thus the Father pleased. Christ drank God's wrath on sin, then cried, "'Tis done." Sin's wage is paid, propitiation won. Verse 4, his robes for mine, such anguish none can know. Christ God's beloved, condemned as though his foe. He as though I, accursed and left alone, I as though he, embraced and welcome home. And then there is regeneration in the chorus. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God, bought by such love, bought regeneration. The price was his life, and our life is no longer our own. He is our praise, our all. It shall be for Christ alone. If you're here today and you're in Christ, my favorite expression of salvation if you're in christ we invite you to participate in the elements of the lord's supper um, we encourage baptism uh, if you're here this morning you're a guest you're a believer you're of a church of like faith and practice we ask you to participate as as well
Let us remember what Christ did for us on his way to the cross. He was, before his way to the cross, he was whipped. His flesh was tore open. The blood began to flow from his body, from his head. His hands were pierced, his feet were pierced. And that cross, and that blood was shed for us. But his body was broken. I'd like to ask Mike to lead us in prayer, Mike Broadfear, thanking the Lord for giving his body for us. Lord, as we remember uh, how you gave yourself for us and how at any time you could have stopped it, you always had the power to put an end to it, but because you loved us and it was the only way to restore the, um, uh, the fellowship and communion with the Father and us, you went, you paid that price, uh, you even forgave those who crucified you and mocked at the cross. Uh, just your love is so amazing, Lord, and thank you for that. And I ask in Christ's name, amen. In remembrance, let's take of the bread. As we remember his blood shed for us, Les will lead us in prayer. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the great love that you have shown for us and the exchange you, uh, 
avenged your son for our sins. We just see how you <coughs> took your son who willingly offered himself on that cross, Roman cross, to shed blood to, um, to cover our sins. And we are eternally grateful, Lord, for your great love that you showed us. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. In remembrance of his shed blood, let's drink. When we have the Lord's Supper, we take one of two offerings. In this uh, month, the offering will be a, for a scholarship fund so that more students could afford uh, the education here at Trinity Baptist School. Pastor Tom is going to lead us in prayer for uh, the, the offering or giving, and then uh, we'll sing together. So men, you may go back to your seats. And then others, gentlemen, if you come to receive the offering, please. I want to commend the crew that came out and did so much work here yesterday on our spring work day. Thank the Lord for safety and, and a lot of good cleaning indoors and mulching and other work that was done outdoors. Well done, everyone. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this. Uh, opportunity uh, once again to contribute to your ministry here in a financial way uh, Lord may we grow in in this work in this task in this opportunity and this uh, responsibility given us by your word to be giving uh, in every way uh, in our service in our in our obedience in our in our giving financially uh, Lord, you provided for us so that we can do this, and pray that we'll do it with cheerful hearts this morning again. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to sing our song of the month again, a song entitled Fountain of Grace. And remain seated as we sing. <clears throat>
sing one more song together. But before that, there's something I gotta tell you about. Something that tickled me this week. <clears throat> I saw this Facebook post that talked about the fine arts competition that went on in South Carolina. And our piano player won first place in the American That's in the country, yeah. the American Association of Christian Schools in the sacred music category. That just, that just tickled me. I wanted to stand <laughs> up and cheer. June is just such a good piano player, but, but she's more than just a good piano player. She's just a really nice gal, and, and she knows how to play the piano. And it just, it's just an honor for us to have Juna play the piano for us every week. She's so faithful, and even when I do something crazy, all I gotta do is just, Look at her, and she knows what I'm thinking. That's pretty bad. <laughs> so, anyways, congratulations, Juna. We really do appreciate our piano player. Let's stand together. We're going to sing His Robes for Mine.
share in our scripture reading this, this morning, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2, 4 to 10. <laughs> you saw that, I wondered why it was leaning. And then when I went to pick it up, it fell apart. <laughs> Let's turn in our Bibles again to Hebrews, please. Chapter 10. Hebrews 10. And we'll read again. You can follow along with me as I read. I'm going to read verses 19 to 25 of Hebrews 10. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. As we move on now to chapter 10 in Hebrews, we are faced with the reality that there are only two possible responses to a knowledge of the truth. One either responds in faith, believing, or he neglects the truth and falls away. This morning, we're going to examine the positive response. Later, the writer shows us a negative response. The positive response is when one comes to a knowledge of the truth, understands the truth intellectually, and the implications of the truth to him personally, accepts it in repentance and faith, and moves forward to commit his life to Christ as Savior and Lord. As we come to this point in the writer's case-closed argument that Jesus is superior to the old system and old covenant and is the supreme one who provides for salvation, he now asks for a response. Up until this point, he has been giving warnings. In chapter 2, the warning was to give more earnest heed lest you drift away. And you will not escape if you neglect such great salvation. Then chapters 4 and 5, there are more warnings. In chapter 6, the warning is, if you know these things and fall away, it is impossible to be renewed to repentance. Warnings are interspersed between presentations of the superiority of Christ. But now beginning in verse 19 of chapter 10, the writer asks for a full response. If 
you look, verse 19 begins with the word therefore. And so he is pointing back to everything that's been written up to this point. In other words, based on all that has been presented, respond. Respond to the truth. And notice the two choices. Verse 22, if you look at that, it says, Draw, new, draw near with a true heart in full assurance. But verse 26 is the other response. <laughs> and that is, continue in sin willfully. When one has been presented with the truth and walks away, his choice is willful. So here in this section, there is an appeal for men to come all the way to Christ on the basis of truth, the basis of doctrine. And let me make a point here. No salvation appeal is really ever made apart from a solid foundation of truth and doctrine. Years ago, when my oldest son was in college, he had a roommate that was a very young Christian. He was eager to grow. And um, my son was a leader in the room and in the hall, and he was helping uh, this young man to grow. He knew the gospel. He had accepted the gospel. He was saved. But he didn't have a lot of Bible knowledge. But he had a desire to share the gospel and truth. Somehow, I don't remember how, but on Facebook, um, he had messaged me. I think he knew that Kyle's dad was a pastor, and so he messaged me. And he was, he was wanting all the arguments against what's false. This uh, belief, this idea, or this cult. And I kept trying to tell him, look, you know the gospel, just present the gospel. Present the truth. You don't have to have an argument against everyone's argument. Sure, it's good to know what others believe. It's good to search the scriptures so that you can give an answer to those. But I was trying to tell him as a young Christian, share the word. Uh, use the scripture. Use an open Bible because that is what the Holy Spirit of God is going to use to open a man's heart to truth and faith. And he, he had a hard time getting that. He had a hard time understanding that. No salvation appeal is ever really made apart from a solid foundation in doctrine, in truth. And in 10 chapters in Hebrews, the writer has been making a doctrinal case about the identity and work of Jesus Christ. And now, 10 chapters in, now he gives an opportunity to respond. The positive response, the right response, the only right response is to accept Christ's salvation. And the appeal is based on three key features in this section that we're in this morning. And those features are faith, hope, and love. They've come up previously as we've worked through this, but now he comes back to them again. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, it is faith. Do you see that in your Bibles? It says, let us draw near with a true heart in what? Can you say the next four words with me? In full assurance of faith. Now look at verse 23. In verse 23, it is hope. It says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And then in verse 24, look there, in verse 24, it is love. He says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. So the appeal is draw near, hold fast, and love. And let us examine those this morning, the only right response, and let us start with faith. I won't read this section again, we just read it, verses 19 to 22. 
Where is faith in verse 22? Can you see it? It is in the words full assurance. Full assurance. Faith is coming to a full assurance and an absolute trust in the gospel, in who Jesus said he is, and in what Jesus has done to provide for us our great salvation. Prior to that appeal is the basis on which to draw near. It starts in verse 19. It says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Believer, we can enter into God's presence because of what Jesus has done. As you know, in the Old Covenant, only the priest could enter the holy places in the tabernacle and later in the temple. Inside, a veil separated the holy place from the holy of holies. And the priest could only enter in one time a year to offer atonement for the sins of the nation of Israel. But now the writer is saying that we, those who believe, can enter into God's presence boldly. The veil was torn down with the bloody sacrifice of Jesus. Because of the new covenant, the redeemed can have boldness. We do not need to go in fearfully, but we can go in boldly. We may enter on the basis that Jesus made the final and perfect sacrifice. He provided entrance that we may go in and we may meet God person to person. Know this, there is no other way to God. No other way to God. You cannot go in based on your own character or your own works. You cannot go in based on what religion you follow or what church you attend. That includes this church. Without Christ's righteousness on your account, justification, we sang about that just a few minutes ago. We talked about it when we took up the Lord's Supper. Without Christ's righteousness on your account, you are unfit to enter the presence of God. But Christ's righteousness imputed to you, placed on your account, gives you a right standard, uh, standing before God. And you may go to Him boldly. I remind you of what it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. It says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus bore our sins. He took the wrath of God. He drank the full cup of God's wrath. And what did he leave for us? He left for us mercy. Justice was served on Christ. So we can go in because when Jesus paid our sin debt, he satisfied God's wrath and mercy remains for us. Can you say amen to that? Earlier we sang his robes for mine. And in song we rejoiced in the great exchange that took place. Our sin was imputed to him. He took that on himself. And in redemption, his righteousness is imputed to us who believe. Now to add to our joy, we can enter calling God our Father. In fact, the scripture says, Abba, Father, meaning Papa. In other words, it's even an intimate relationship that we can have. So run into God's loving arms and keep coming into his presence with prayer. Through prayer. So this is the new covenant. And notice in verse 20 that it provides a new way. And it says a living way. 
Notice the new and living way is through the veil of his flesh. Jesus' flesh. It is a living way because he conquered sin, he died, he was buried in a tomb, and he rose again to life, providing for us eternal or everlasting life. But it is also a living way because we are made alive spiritually. We who were dead have been given spiritual life. And this was uh, read by Pastor Tom, but let's be reminded of Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5. It says, But God, who is rich in what? Mercy. Because of His great what? Love. Which, with which He loved us, even when we were what? Dead in trespasses, made us what? Alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. Jesus said to Martha, as recorded in John 11, verses 25 to 26, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die physically, he shall live spiritually. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe this congregation in front of me? Before being in Christ, your salvation, you were spiritually dead. You were dead to God in trespasses and sin. You were destined for hell because in Jesus, those who come to him are actually given new life, that's regeneration, new birth. You have spiritual life as the Spirit of God lives in you. And you now can do right. You can please Him. You have positional righteousness through justification, but now you're to live with practical righteousness, and you actually can do right. You can please God. You can live for Him. You can glorify God with your life. And listen, one day you will be united with Him in heaven glorified. This new and living way came to us through the veil that is His flesh. When Jesus had his flesh ripped open for us on the cross and died, you remember that the veil in the temple at his death, as the earth shook, that veil in the temple ripped from top to bottom. Boy, did God give a symbol, didn't he? That now you may enter in, but only because of the work of His Son, Jesus Christ. A work that you must receive. His sacrifice opened the way for you to God. He died and He rose again to life. And now He sits at the right hand of the throne of God as a great priest. He is mediating and interceding for you and for me. He is there securing a place for you. Earlier in Hebrews, we read that, that the believer is anchored there. You are anchored there by His presence. You are inseparably and eternally united in Him. So draw near and enter boldly, not irreverently, not flippantly, but boldly, meaning without fear. But you must also see this in verse 22. Look at verse 22 again. It says, you must come with a true heart. That means genuinely, with no ulterior motive, no hypocrisy, no superficiality. It must be genuine your coming. It must be real. And that is the only way you may come. And you must come, it says, with your whole heart. The inner man, with your mind and with your will and with your 
emotion and with real commitment holding nothing back. Well, if, if we haven't gotten that idea yet from Hebrews, I, I don't know what's, what's fogged our thinking because the writer is saying to that, to that Jew who's, who's still having a hard time leaving the old system and the sinner who maybe still wants to hold on to his sin or the one who thinks that maybe I can get to heaven by my own self-will, he's saying, come all the way to Christ. And you must come to Him alone. Now notice it says to draw near in full assurance of what? Faith. With belief, no doubting, you must believe to come. Later on in Hebrews, the writer says, without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Now notice what happens when one comes believing. This is a wonderful truth that is so helpful for all of us to think of. We have our hearts, it says, sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This is a picture of Old Testament practice and ritual, if you will. The priest had to wash everything. He had to, to wash all the equipment that was going to go into the Holy of Holies. He had to wash himself numerous times. <laughs> and then when he went in, he sprinkled the blood of the sacrifice on the mercy seat. And all this was external. It was symbolic, but it had to be repeated over and over and over again. But Jesus can cleanse your heart. By His Spirit, He cleanses us on the inside. And then it says, in doing so, He purges our conscience. Conscience brings guilt, doesn't it? Conscience condemns. Guilt can't be removed until sin is removed. But Jesus' blood removes our sins and our conscience becomes free from guilt. Titus 3 and verse 5 on the screen here says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His what? His mercy. He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. And then you see Ephesians 5, 26 there says that he might satisfy, I'm sorry, sanctify and cleanse her, it's really referring to the church, with the washing of water by the word. You should notice two things occurring there. Your sins are covered in the blood, and your life is transformed. It's being transformed. So there is a positional satisfaction that takes place. There is a positional sanctification, Christ's righteousness on your account. And then there will be a practical sanctification that's taken place. And now let's move on to hope. Let's read again verse 23. Would you look at that with me? Verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. We must and will hold fast the confession. You might say that holding on is the human side of eternal security. I want you to understand what I mean by that. We know that God holds those who are in Christ. Amen? Amen? We know that. He holds them in the power of His omnipotent hand. We who are genuinely in Christ are safe. We are eternally secure. But it says, let us hold fast our confession of our hope, knowing He who promised eternal life is faithful. So God saves us, 
And we who are saved hold on to his promise. A true believer holds on. Perseverance is a sign of our belief. A true believer continues in Christ. Remember who the writer is, the original recipients, who are not yet holding on, who in keep, he's been warning, but now he's calling for the response. He, uh, the believer continues in Christ. He will not walk away. He will not fall away. He, he will not slip past that safe harbor of salvation. He'll come all the way. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, if you continue in my word, you are my disciple. Do you remember in the Gospels or remember from our uh, study in Mark that the multitudes began to thin out as the miracles slowed and as the free lunches stopped coming. Do you remember that? In fact, when that happened, Jesus said to his disciples, will you leave too? And they held on. They held on. Remember the original recipients, again, of the epistle. Some of the Jews had not yet come all the way to Christ alone. And the writer's saying, come on. And hold on. So hold on in hope. Perhaps there are some here this morning that you're, you're having doubts. And there are various reasons for doubts. But folks, those who have come genuinely with their heart and have called upon the name of the Lord in, in repentance, repenting of their sin, in full faith and trust, there is no need for, for doubt. The writer says, come on and hold on. So hold on and hope your trust. Will God keep his promise of salvation for those that receive it, church? Yes, he will. He keeps those he saves because he promised. And no doubt, God keeps his promise. In fact, here's the very promise in one place. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 says, He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Now, the, the second, of, second positive response here is hope. If you believe and your faith is real, you will hold on. Let's look at the third element here, love. I want to read verse 24 again. It's short, look at it. Verse 24, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. The next few verses we often know and maybe even quote portions of them, including the one that says, Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. Let's make sure we keep this in context. You can use the verses probably in the way you have used them, but let's, let's make sure we understand the context here. We don't want to miss this. The writer, the Holy Spirit, is saying here, come on, hold on, and now he adds fellowship with believers in the assembly, provoking one another to love and good works. Please understand this. This is about fellowshipping with other believers by faithfully assembling with the church and stimulating those who are on the edge to come all the way to Christ by leaving the old system and accepting Christ alone for salvation. The writer is saying, keep the fellowship. Don't go back. You need each other and you need to provoke one another to love and good works. And get this, those that were falling away were leaving the assembly and were at risk of going back to the old system. The admonition here is don't do that. Don't go back. Be together and encourage one another to be faithful. Stimulate each other to godliness. 
I think this is a very important question. I want you to listen to this question very carefully. I, I believe the, the question is rhetorical. I believe the answer is obvious. But here's, here's the question. What does this say about someone who claims salvation but doesn't assemble with the body and worse yet, won't give up their religious rituals or abandon trust in their own works? That's important. That's serious for us to understand. Let me, let me ask that question again. What does it say about someone who claims salvation but doesn't assemble with the church, the body, Christ's church, and worse yet, won't give up their religious rituals or abandon trust in their own works? To genuine believers, there's an admonition here. And that is to be faithful to the gathering of believers and participate in helping others in a loving way. You see, we're supposed to influence each other. We're supposed to help each other. We're supposed to encourage each other. That word provoke is a strong word, isn't it? Another another translation is to irritate one another, to keep encouraging. Sometimes it's positive. Sometimes it may be a negative message. But we're to do that. And uh, what, what does that look like? These verses, what, what do those last three verses look like? Shouldn't we conclude that it involves attending the assemblies of the church? And doesn't that sound like discipleship incurring, occurring in the body? That provoking and encouraging one another? Certainly, that sounds like discipleship to me. Folks, here is what you need. Here's what we need. You need the Bible education hour that we call Life Group. You need that. To not be faithful to that means that you're not growing in your knowledge. Well, I do my own Bible study, Pastor Rob. I, I have a group elsewhere where I do that Bible study. You need, to, you need to study the Word of God with this local expression of the body of Christ, this church that you've been called to, that you're attending, that you're a member of. I, I really am convinced that the conferencing is the best way to do what we call Sunday school. I've seen Sunday school done many ways. I've done Sunday school many ways. But the idea that you can come and you can hear the proclamation of the Word of God. You have an uh, outline in the bulletin that usually Betsy makes it so you can actually pull it out. And you remove it from the bulletin and work on the other side. And there are questions. Then you can do your own Bible study through answering the questions. And then you get together with a group of believers and you can work together and discuss those together. Do you think if you will faithfully do that, that by the time we reach the end of Hebrews, that you will know Hebrews well and you will not only understand the truth and the doctrine of Hebrews, but you will also apply. Life group leaders, make sure you get to the last few questions. Sometimes we, the discussions are great. I've been in the classes and the discussions can go pretty long. But generally, not always, but generally I try to make some application in the last question or two. And, and is the application important? Folks, we can stuff our head full of Bible knowledge. But it better reach our heart, our mind, our behavior, our conduct, the way we live for Christ. We need that. You, you need the worship service. The one you're attending right now where we corporately declare to God His worth and respond to His word. You need your children to be in expeditions that they may be challenged with salvation and spiritual growth. Your teens need Sunday night so that the teaching reaches them right where they are at that stage of life. You need to be at the Sunday evening gathering here in the auditorium, auditorium where the teaching may generally be more topical and you can devote some time with your brothers and sisters of Christ in prayer. 
that we can pray together. You need a discipleship group where you can encourage one another in their spiritual growth and that you can provoke one another to love and good works. But Pastor Rob, that's a lot. That's good. <laughs> and, and I'm asking you to take steps if you're not there yet. Just take steps. You know that the early New Testament church met daily. How would American Christians handle that? We got up here next Sunday and Pastor Tom said, we're making an announcement. We're going to have a service every evening for now on. Seven o'clock. <laughs> well, that's, well, I can't do that. That's too much. Well, we can't do what the early church did. They could walk a block or two. They could be in the home that was going to become a church. It was the beginnings of a church. But folks, you need the church. Can I just say that? And then you, you make the call, but you need the church. Do you remember, some of you that are my age, do you remember Hillary Clinton wrote a book? And what was the title? It Takes a Village? Is that what it was? So you need the government to help you to get through life? Folks, <laughs> I, di I didn't hear that. You could tell me that afterwards. <laughs> Folks, we, we, without getting too political, we would like the government to stay out of our life, our business, and just keep us safe. Wouldn't that be nice? The government did the job that God ordained it for, to keep us safe, to create an environment where there, there can be justice. Before I get too political, let me just give you the reason for the, the application of bringing up the book. It doesn't take a village, but I'm telling you right now, it takes a church. That's biblical. It takes a church. So, moms and dads, have your children in the church. Let people help you. Man, I am, I'm off notes, but I am so thankful for a church, godly people that helped Dana and I. Sunday school teachers, teachers in a Christian school. And my kids, if you talk to them as now as adults, they'll tell you who their favorite teacher was. I would always ask him the question because I wanted him to answer, you, Dad. Because <laughs> I taught him a lot. Dana taught him in their elementary. No, she didn't. She was at home at that time. Did you teach any of our kids, Dana? Elise. She taught Elise, the last one, the youngest who went to school. She ended up teaching Elise. But I, t I taught them from 7th to 12th grade. I was their Bible teacher, I was their history teacher, I was their youth pastor as they got older, and I, we joke about, you. maybe you've heard me say this, I, I'll tell my kids to say, you know, if you're messed up, it really is my fault. <laughs> my poor kids, I was their, their dad, their teacher, their school principal, and their youth pastor. But in spite of that, I'm glad for the other godly Christians in their life that they'll still talk about to this day. Mrs. Champlain, who when I first met her called her Mrs. Champlain. She said, it's not the lake, Pastor Rob, it's Champlain. Mrs. Doyle, and I could go on and on. Two, just a couple weeks of being in there before the, my predecessor officially left and I officially took his place. My boys were saying, Wow, Pastor Tagan, Pastor Tagan Joe, he now pastors a church in uh, New Hampshire. Man, I learned so much from Pastor Tagan. I wasn't threatened by that. I was excited about that. He was a godly man. Folks, it, it takes a church. You, you need the church, not just for your kids, but you need it for you. I need it for me. And so that, yes, it's a strong application. We need each other. 
I was with about 12, 10 people from our church last night. And we could call it fellowship because we're Baptists because we were eating. <laughs> That's fellowship for Baptists. And you know what? We just enjoyed one another. We built stronger relationships. They're pretty strong to begin with, but we built stronger relationships. And there are people that encourage me. Hopefully I encourage them. And Pastor Tom and his sweet wife were there. We, we need each other. So be with the family and love on one another. So we have three things here, faith, hope, and love. They are salvation's focus. And here's the invitation. And it's not my invitation, it's the passage's invitation. And so very quickly, let's look at the invitation. The first invitation is come. If you're still here, and you've been attending, and you've been hearing these messages on Hebrews, and you have not yet come to Christ genuinely from the heart, and have not accepted his great salvation, the salvation that only comes through him, not of any works or religious belief. If you have not yet come, won't you come? Won't you see Pastor Tom or me this morning and let us help you come to Christ in salvation? So come, the door to salvation is open. And with that, believe. Place your faith in God, full trust. And with full trust is obedience and it is commitment. And then enter, enter into his presence and stay. Stay there in what? Stay there in hope. Hold on. And then the last one, commune. Commune in fellowship with your fellow believers. We who have seen the legitimacy of saving faith, we are to hold fast. It cannot be superficial, and it cannot fade away. So may God help us, and may God help our fellowship of love with one another. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Well, Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for giving your son. I thank you for the son, Jesus, who went to that cross, drank the full cup of your wrath, paid our sin debt. And if we will just accept his gift of salvation, that we can have a restored and right relationship with you. We are put in a right standing with you, and we can be in your presence for all of eternity. Father, thank you for that. If there is one or more here today that have not come, Lord, may your spirit convict and convince them of the truth and open their heart to faith. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll close our service with the song, I Run to Christ, verses 1 and 3. Let's stand together.
as well at 5.30, so please come. You are dismissed.